Hello and welcome to the Magna Carta 2022. The Magna Carta 2022 is basically a free prelims crash course for the upcoming 2022 civil services preliminary exam. We are going to now be discussing judiciary under lecture number 7. And we are going to be following a very simple structure as far as judiciary is concerned. We will understand the structure, we will understand the components, we will thereafter understand a comparative review between the Supreme Court and the High Court. We will of course keep a greater focus on the Supreme Court. We will then understand what are the basic key facts that you must remember as far as the pre is concerned. Now why does judiciary become a cause of concern for aspirants preparing for the civil services prelims exam? It is because the judiciary by the nature of itself is a fairly fairly complex subject and it has one of the highest presence in your newspapers and our newspapers have a tendency to get into excruciating detail explaining procedures and legal principles and legal arguments which often confuse aspirants and, and often mislead them to the relevant amount of depth that they have to get into. It is this particular topic that has to be done with the highest amount of caution and the highest amount of discretion must be applied to studying judiciary. In fact, I would not be wrong in saying that it is more important to know what not to study in the judiciary as opposed to what to study. Because the prelims in judiciary always asks very, very simple, clear, direct questions. So let's begin. Let's first understand the overall arrangement of the Indian judicial system. Now, we start right from the top. The Supreme Court happens to be our apex court. Then you have high courts. You can have one high court for each state. You can have a single high court for two states. You can have a high court for a state and a union territory combined. You can have a high court for two union territories combined. That's all right. All of it depends on logistical considerations. And then at the district level, you have your district courts. The Supreme Court and the High Court is collectively called the Higher Judiciary. Anything below the High Courts are called Lower Judiciary. Interestingly, the Constitution does refer to the Supreme Court, the High Court and the District Courts very, very clearly. It refers to broad procedures for appointment of Supreme Court, High Court and District Court judges. Below the district courts, between the district and the village level, that is usually around the block level, you have your local courts. Now, as a UPSC aspirant, this is not in your syllabus. You do not have to study the complicated structure, the procedures of local courts. Why is that the case? It's because this is largely governed under the dimensions of a particular state. The structure and the organization of local courts in state A versus the structure and the organization of local courts in state B can vastly differ. Which is why you will not be asked technical details of these lower courts. So your Munsif courts, your Chief Metropolitan Magistrate, your Magisterial Courts, your Metropolitan Courts, your Civil Courts, Junior Division, Civil Courts, Senior Division. As lawyers, as students of the law, we have a keen interest in it. It is something that we deal with on a daily basis. But you don't have to worry about this. Okay? And then you have, at the absolute grassroots level, at the Panchayat village level, you've got Gram Nayales. Now, Gram Nayales have been given a nationwide recognition in national legislative umbrella under the Gram Nayales Act of 2008. This is done because the center has created a national law which has ensured that almost every state 
should have your gram naya layers. This is to create a further subdivision of the lower courts so that greater people have access to courts which are closer to them. And that is why gram nihalis will entertain both civil and criminal cases. This is important. See, both the center and the states can make laws around local courts. The center chooses to not get into local courts as far as the states are concerned. But to promote a sense of of better judicial outreach, we have a national law called the Gram Nayales Act. And this is why Gram Nayales are asked in the prelims and not local courts. This becomes your mainframe judicial system. Now we understand that our primary problems with the judicial system is that we do not have specialized courts. There are issues of pendency. There are issues of delays and we're not able to bring in the technical expertise. Now to solve those issues, we've started creating another layer of courts which will run parallelly to the mainframe judicial system and will integrate as and when needed. So let us say we want to solve the problem of specialization and we want to solve the problem of Pendency. So through a constitutional amendment, we've created something called tribunals. Now, the fundamental difference is tribunals <coughs> are comprised of judges as well as administrators, whereas courts are comprised only of judges. So only judges can be judges in courts. Whereas tribunals, you can have judges as judges and you can also have administrators as judges. Which is why in the mains when you study tribunalization of justice, it is a very very important issue of separation of powers. Because the judiciary says the tribunals are fundamentally performing a judicial function. So we as the judiciary should have a greater say in the composition and the functioning of tribunals. The government says, but we've created them. We are the ones taking care of their functioning. They are here to solve a larger policy redressal purpose. So we will have a higher say. And of course, there is a plethora of Supreme Court judgments. Not important for the pre, but of course for the means, it's a fairly important topic. So through the constitutional amendment, we added two articles, 323A and 323B, wherein we allowed for the creation of tribunals okay 323a primarily deals with tribunals which are administrative in nature which are going to hear cases involving administration and administrators so for example you are a civil servant and you believe that you should have been promoted but you haven't been promoted and somebody else is and you think that is a violation of certain principles of law, then you'll have to come to the administrative tribunal. The administrative tribunal can only be created by the parliament and the general principle is that you'll have one administrative tribunal for the centre and you'll have one administrative tribunal for each of the states. That is why the one at the centre is called the central administrative tribunal, right? The central administrative tribunal. On the other hand, you have Article 323B, which allows for the creation of any other tribunal. And these tribunals can be created by both the parliament or the state legislatures, depending on who has the powers to. And you can create a hierarchy of tribunals. For example, you could have a, an income tax tribunal and you can have an income tax appellate tribunal. So all the bunch of tribunals that we've heard of, they are essentially created under 323B. This has been in the news for quite some time where 
the government has tried to rationalize the tribunals has in fact merged a lot of tribunals uh, into into uh, larger brackets so for example um, the company law tribunal is now handling more than just company law cases uh, we've also abolished a lot of tribunals for example the film certificate appellate tribunal wherein um, appeals from the censor board could therefore reach that has also been abolished so there are a lot of these tribunals that can be created under 323b what is interesting to note is that these tribunals can also become entry points if you want to appeal decisions of certain regulators if you have an issue with a decision that has been made against you by a regulator right then you can appeal to the tribunal for example the securities exchange board of india is a regulator it gets to decide certain questions of law and fact with respect to capital markets so if they take a decision perverse to you then you could have ideally gone to the securities appellate tribunal or the securities tribunal right so that's how tribunals work the fundamental difference is tribunals are run by both judges and administrators as judges but the mainframe legal system is run fundamentally by judges which is also why tribunals are fairly more relaxed in terms of their procedures whereas the mainframe court legal system is more structured and is more duty bound to their procedures right now we've tried to solve the problem of specialization and pendency depending on the nature and the hierarchy of tribunals some cases on appeal from tribunals can go to the high court and some can go to the supreme court right so for example let us say if it is an appellate tribunal then an appeal from an appellate tribunal will go to the supreme court but if it is not an appellate tribunal then it may directly go to the high court all of this depends from tribunal to tribunal for example the national green tribunal appeals from the national green tribunal well procedurally can actually go to the supreme court and the high court as well depending on the nature of appeal and that's something we must understand right now let us look at solving uh, specialization and pendency problems as far as uh, you know local personal matters are concerned that is why we've also created something called family courts and they've been created dedicatedly through the family courts act of 1984 they run parallelly to district courts and they only look at say family disputes say divorce proceedings they they look at say matrimonial violence cases largely because there are so many of them so you have a dedicated court at the level of every district in the state of course some districts will not have the manpower to do so but if you do then you have a dedicated family court right they will hear civil and criminal cases relating to fact uh, to family disputes now we we'll look at the pendency problem a lot of people don't come to court with complex legal problems a larger chunk of our legal disputes are essentially factual in nature and we come to a court for the court to resolve that factual dispute between two parties so you may not require the attention and the full force of the judicial system to solve what is called a very basic or a very naive issue and and because the courts are often been dealing with this they get severely overburdened it's a matter of fact that more than 70% of our pending cases are actually in the lower courts and to solve specifically this problem the government created something called lok adalats which were given a statutory a statutory status 
under the Legal Service Authorities Act, which also provides for a national legal services authority, state legal services authorities, also provides for district legal services authorities, where the Chief Justice of India also heads the National Legal Services Authority, and of course, um, the Chief Justice of the High Court uh, heads the State Legal Services Authority, and so on and so forth. So if you can't afford a lawyer, you can come to them, and they'll help you get a lawyer. You don't have to pay for it. Okay? But it is also through this act that you've institutionalized the system of Lok Adalats. Now, Lok Adalats are what are called voluntary courts. If there are two people who have a dispute, and if both people agree that this is too complex, this is too time consuming, this is too expensive, let us go to a simpler court. This will be faster, cheaper, certainly more, more, certainly simpler and certainly quicker and we will get our decision in a record amount of time and if both the parties agree then your case could be heard at the Lok Adalat. Now this does not mean murder cases could be heard because crimes are always committed against the state because India is a commonwealth nation. You can't go and, and, and mutually resolve a murder which is why Lok Adalat's fundamentally deal with civil cases only wherein you can resolve the dispute amongst the two parties sometimes cases can be directed to lok adalats also and because this is voluntary both the parties have agreed to come to lok adalat and once the decision has been made and one of them is unhappy you can't come back here you can't come back here and that's the fundamental understanding. Once at the Lok Adalat, your journey ends at the Lok Adalat. If it is a family court, you are unhappy with the decision, you can always appeal to a higher court. Tribunal cases can be appealed to a higher court. Now, let's take a magnifying glass and spend some time on the higher judicial system in the country, which is also an excellent example of rule number two center stronger than the states and also checks and balances. So basically, it is the president <coughs> who appoints both Supreme Court and High Court judges. The appointment to both Supreme Court and High Court judges is formally made by the president. And we know that the president of course has no independent uh, powers or no discretionary powers as such. So, of course, the president will work on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. However, as far as oaths are concerned, for logistical reasons and as a hollow candy, the president delivers the oath only to Supreme Court judges and the governor delivers the oath only to High Court judges. Now comes the checks and balances and rule number two, centre stronger than the states. I understand that high courts are the highest legal institutions in a state. I understand that the high courts fundamentally, juri their, their jurisdiction lies within the state that, 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 that they are a high court of. But both Supreme Court and high courts are removed in the exact same manner by the parliament. The state legislatures have zero role in the removal of Supreme Court and High Court judges. And this also gives you a very incredible insight. If Supreme Court and High Court judges can be removed in the same manner, they will also more or less have very similar qualifications, which also means they will have very similar powers also. In the UPSC aspirant community, there is a larger misconception that the Supreme Court is the be-all and end-all. But you must understand, except for one or two additional powers that the Supreme Court has, the high courts of a state can do exactly everything that the Supreme Court can and some of those even on a wider domain. So it is unfair to, to not regard high courts as incredibly important and powerful institutions, right? Now, especially the higher courts, the Supreme Court and the high courts have two very important features. 
they are that they are courts of record and they have the powers to punish for contempt now uh, what is courts of what is a court of record so both the supreme court and the high courts are courts of record the name is sufficient enough when we say that the supreme court is a court of record it means every judgment every order ever delivered by the supreme court will always be preserved documented in permanence in perpetuity now the question is why because of two reasons one if you have every judgment delivered to be documented you will have better ease in revising those judgments later on you can revise your own judgments because times change so the dimensions and the ideas of the courts will also change and two only if you have something written down can you actually check whether it is being followed or not if the supreme court gave a judgment saying x that a has to do x but a is not doing x a is basically violating a supreme court order so a has to be punished the supreme court can only punish a if the supreme court tells a that listen here is my order x you were supposed to implement it but you haven't done it so you have disrespected my order now i'm going to take action against you principles of rule of law principles of natural justice there has to be a clear legal violation for a legal action to be taken place and that is why court of record is the birthplace of contempt if you want the courts to punish you for contempt the courts must have a document of why they believe you are in violation now of course contempt is mentioned in the constitution for both the supreme court and the high court but the technical details of this are mentioned in the contempt of court act we will look into it in detail there are basically civil and criminal contempts civil contempts is basically if you don't follow a court order a supreme court or a high court court order and a criminal contempt is contempt is if you say anything or if you express yourself if you do anything which jeopardizes the reputation of the judge or the court as large right so of course you can be fined for civil contempt you can be fined and jailed for criminal contempt that's the basic difference what is interesting to note is the supreme court can only punish for its own contempt whereas the high courts can not only punish for the contempt of that high court but all the lower courts subordinate to the high court so the high court is the custodian of contempt for all lower courts this is one of the reasons why the high courts also have sufficiently enormous powers the principle is very clear the president is going to appoint judges of the senior of the higher judiciary as far as district court district courts are concerned the governor appoints on the consultation of the relevant high courts as far as the lower courts is concerned this gets interpreted and now this gets implemented in a more technical form and that is why you have your pcs j exams or your state judiciary exams the written part of it conducted by the government of the state the interviews are conducted by high court judges and of course finally appointed by the governor gram nayalays because you have a central legislature will have of course dedicated appointment procedures but for at least lower court lower court and high court judges uh, lower court and district court judges i'm sorry this is the general procedure again this is too diverse and and too customized for the states so you will not be asked this in the prelims what you really need to know are the broader appointment procedures of the supreme court and the high courts which is why in the news they've been saying that we should have an all india judicial services where the written exam is conducted nationally and then you have an interview and judges are appointed for these layers at a national level of course 
there are some advantages and disadvantages of the same they are not particularly to be done as far as the prelims are concerned okay the fundamental principle the underlying concept to understand judiciary is the fact that it is independent and it is integrated these are two extremely important bases for setting up of the indian judicial system when we say the judiciary is independent the first question that we must ask ourselves is why is the judiciary independent we say that the judiciary is independent because it needs to perform a certain set number of functions what are these functions first the judiciary and especially the higher judiciary has to figure out whether a law is violating a fundamental right under part 3 article 13 clause 2 two it may also need to figure out whether a law is violating any other provision of the constitution and can it and three when we have a twin layer of government the central and the state governments conflicts are bound to arise and if conflicts are bound to arise you need an independent authority adjudicating over these conflicts and if you need an independent authority adjudicating over these conflicts you have to make sure that they are independent and what is meant by independent it does not mean that nobody is going to ask judiciary what they do they are not accountable to anyone no Abs absolutism under law does not exist it's all relative the judiciary is more independent then the other respective branches of government we understand that the executive is accountable to the legislature in some manner more specifically the council of ministers are collectively accountable to the lok sabha there is an accountability mechanism in fact the council of ministers have to be chosen from both the houses of the parliament now interestingly when we say that the supreme court is independent which means they get to appoint higher judiciary they get to devise their own rules of procedure they are relatively not interfered by as far as the government is concerned as far as integrated is concerned right from the highest court to the lowest court because you are a court of record it is easy to say that the supreme court judgment is x it will be binding on the lowest court of the country and from the lowest court of the country on appeal 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 you have the right to reach the supreme court if the state legislatures fail to pass a law it does not go on appeal to the lok sabha or the rajya sabha but if you are unhappy with the decision of a high court then you can appeal to the supreme court that makes the system integrated so it is very important for the judiciary to be independent so that you have a functional federal country you have protected fundamental rights and you have examined laws that may have violated the constitution and this is also the birthplace of judicial review examining the constitutional validity of laws now that we understand courts we must also understand the judicial system does not just only have courts the judicial system would also have a lot of other things beyond courts right so let's look at the composition of the legal system and we will focus on the two higher courts you've got the supreme court you've got the chief justice of india who heads the supreme court is the is 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 the senior most judge and will come to the procedures you've got judges to the supreme court and you've got lawyers now understand this because the supreme court is the highest court of the country and every minute of the supreme court is important just because you can go on appeal to the supreme court doesn't mean you should go on appeal to the supreme court it may not be a case which requires an interpretation of law it may not be a case which will require examining a substantial question of law 
just because you have the legal recourse to go on appeal from a lower court to a higher court doesn't mean you'll keep going knocking at the Supreme Court's door because you're taking away time from the Supreme Court to examine something which could possibly change the course of future of the country. And that is why you have a special set of lawyers in the Supreme Court. They're called advocates on record. These advocates on record are the only lawyers who can file a case in the Supreme Court. There can be other lawyers who can argue with this AOR at the court. But this is the person who has to file the case in the Supreme Court. And for this, you need to have a minimum no a number of years of practice and you need to clear an AOR written exam. Don't worry, most well-known Supreme Court lawyers are not AORs, which is often why it is discussed that this is not serving the purpose why it was intended. You had the institution of advocates on record to, to essentially ensure that if the case was not worthy of the time of the Supreme Court, then the AOR will not file it to the Supreme Court. But of course, justice also comes with a certain transactional value to it. So these are called advocates on record. Okay. They're simply lawyers who have the power to file cases at the Supreme Court. They can be assisted by other lawyers who will actually argue the case. They'll be the main lawyers. But the filing has to be done in the name of the AOR. Then you also have something called senior advocates. Now senior advocates are designated senior advocates by the court in consultation with the Supreme Court Bar Association, which is essentially an organization of um, the lawyers at the Supreme Court and any lawyer at the Supreme Court or any lawyer uh, can actually take membership of the Supreme Court Bar Association. There are some uh, conditions that you have to meet and if the court and if the bar thinks that you're an exceptional lawyer and, and you have you know fought your cases very very well and, and you have the competency that it takes then you are designated a senior advocate. The only advantage is, is that you probably wear a gown of a different style and you would possibly get preference in chamber allocation. But this does not necessarily mean that your legal practice will shoot up. You may sometimes be invited by the court to assist the matters uh, as an amicus query, which is basically a friend of the court. And then of course you have your usual advocates. Now, the advocates will represent the parties in front of the judges. There has to be some administrative mechanism which will take care of this interaction. And that is why and a lot of people don't know this, is that the Supreme Court also actually has something called a Secretary General. Yep, it's an administrative authority. And you have registrars of the Supreme Court who will examine the cases before they are put up for judges for their review. So when you go to the court, there is a filing office, the registrar is going to be sitting there, you will give them the case file, they will examine it, they will check if there are any defects in the matter or not, and then they will allot it to a court. The court will first see whether the case is good enough to be admitted, and then will actually start the actual hearing of the court. In some cases, such as death penalty cases, from registrar, it directly reaches the hearing stage. But that's procedural detail that you don't have to worry about, right? Similarly, at the high courts, you have the chief justice of the high court, you've got judges, you've got lawyers, and you've got the administration, which is also run by registrars. The only difference is here, you do not have advocates on record. You have senior advocates and advocates. So advocates are anybody who have a law degree and are registered and enrolled to practice at a court. So you have to be enrolled in the bar council of a specific state for you to practice anywhere in the country. So you may be registered with the say UP bar council, but you could still happily practice at a Delhi court. Nobody's going to stop you. Previously, a few years ago, that was the case, but now they've amended the Advocates Act, I think of 1961. So this is the general composition of the courts. Now, <clears throat> let's get into the technical details, right? Now, when we look at the laws, when we understand the regulation 
of the Supreme Court and the High Court. We must understand this with very clear and, and careful consideration. See. So, there are some provisions in the Constitution which are applicable to the Supreme Court and High Court. There are some common laws which have been made by the Parliament to regulate or to give certain directions to Supreme Court and High Court. So the Judges Inquiry Act supports constitutional provisions for removal of judges. The Judges Protection Act of 1985 gives immunity to Supreme Court and High Court judges. The Contempt of Courts Act gives contempt powers to the Supreme Court and the High Court judges. All of these three laws actually owe their origin to the constitution. The constitution allows for these laws to be created and these have all been created by the parliament. We also have some very old laws such as the Court Fees Act of 1870, but don't worry about it, right? Now, there are some laws created by the parliament only and only for the Supreme Court and some laws again created by the parliament, but only and only for the High Court. So you have the Supreme Court Salaries Conditions of Service Act of 1958 and the Supreme Court Number of Judges Act of 1956. This governs the salary, the pension, the travel allowances, all of those things. So these acts are also supplemented with delegation, a delegated legislation called rules. And you also have the Supreme Court Number of Judges Act of 1956, again passed by the Parliament, which determines the strength of the Supreme Court judges. Both of these are again passed by the Parliament, which is also why very recently, we increased the number of Supreme Court judges from, uh, from a lesser number to 34, which means now we have 34 Supreme Court judges, including the Chief Justice of India. This was done very recently and I've discussed this with you before. This was a financial bill because when you're increasing the number of Supreme Court judges, you're bringing in new judges and this is going to be an expenditure on the CFI. So it's actually a financial bill category B. Okay. Anyways, similarly, you've got the High Court Judges Salaries and Conditions of Service Act of 1954, which again governs the salaries, your travel allowances, your dearness allowances, your basic employment conditions of High Court Judges. Right. Now, apart from this, because we are an independent judiciary, the Supreme Court and the high courts have the powers to draft their own rules. So you've got Supreme Court rules, you've got high court rules. These rules will never violate anything mentioned in any law. These rules are like delegated legislations, which the Supreme Court has released. These are called judicial notifications. They give you technical details. So for example, let us say you want to uh, file a writ petition in the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court rules will give you a format of filing the writ petition and so on and so forth. Similarly, you will have High Court rules drafted by the respective Supreme Court and the High Courts. They have the powers to do this because the Constitution allows them to do so. Right? This is why they are able to do this. Right? Now. Very honestly, all that the constitution says is Supreme Court and High Court judges are appointed by the president after consulting Supreme Court and High Court judges. This is all that the constitution actually says as of today. Now this of course requires a massive amount of interpretation. How will you consult the Supreme Court, High Court judges? Will the consultation be binding? How will the president interact with the Council of Ministers once an advice has been made? And for that, we've got the third judge's case, which gave some technical guidelines. So the collegium system actually owes its origin to the third judge's case. There is no such word called collegium in the Constitution of India. The third judge's case interpreted this constitutional provision and said 
the president is going to appoint Supreme Court High Court judges through a collegium process which will comprise of X number of judges and this is how we are going to appoint a Supreme Court and High Court judges. Right? A few years ago, we tried to change this system through the National Judicial Appointments Commission which was the 99th Constitutional Amendment Act wherein we wanted uh, members of the executive and the legislature to also participate in the appointment of Supreme Court, High Court judges. The Supreme Court struck it down saying independence of judiciary is basic structure. So you've got nothing to worry about. This does not exist. We only have this as a system. Now, after the Supreme Court declared the 99th constitutional amendment as invalid and there were larger questions on the transparency of the collegium process, the government, the central government had the powers to draft rules. If the Supreme Court has the powers to draft rules, so does the central government and they drafted a memorandum of procedure for Supreme Court appointments and a memorandum of procedure for High Court appointments. This is to give further technical details of the collegium process. I'll give you a small example. For example, the collegium process says you have to consult the Chief Justice and four senior most judges to appoint any other judge of the Supreme Court. The memorandum of procedure says the recommendation will go to the law minister, from the law minister will go to the prime minister, from the prime minister will then go to the president. Is any of this relevant for you for the exam? No. And this is why the UPSC never asks you details of the collegium process because they are not in the constitution. This is a judicial interpretation. And this judicial interpretation has been given further technical clarity through the memorandum of association. And that is why it becomes so legally complex. It cannot be asked as an objective question. The collegium says the president must consult the chief justice and four senior Supreme Court judges. Fair enough. But then, does it go to the president and then to the council of ministers and then back to the president? Or does it go to the Council of Ministers and then to the President? That technical detail is mentioned actually in the Memorandum of Procedure. This is why it is not asked in the pre. This is why in the pre they only ask you this groundbreaking constitutional fundamental provision. And now let's focus on this provision itself. According to the Constitution, very clearly, all Supreme Court and High Court judges are appointed by the President after consultation with whatever Supreme Court or High Court judges the President may deem fit. Clear? That's it. This is all that the Constitution says as far as appointment of Supreme Court, High Court judges are concerned. Now, you have Supreme Court judges that have to be appointed you have High Court judges that have to be appointed. Supreme Court judges who are appointed, their oath I told you is delivered by the President. High Court judges, their oath is delivered by the Governor. Now, I told you, the third judge's case further gave an interpretation to this consultation and created what is called the collegium process or the collegiatory process. That these are the number of judges that you are going to consult. And then you have a further number of Supreme Court cases on how is the consultation consultative, is it plural, is it concurrence, what is the difference between may and shall, all of that is, all of that is irrelevant as far as the pre is concerned. And then to give your technical procedural details, you have your memorandum of procedures. One memorandum of procedures for Supreme Court appointments, one, memorand one memorandum of procedures for High Court appointments. So, all you need to know for the pre is, all Supreme Court judges are appointed through a collegium which consists of the Chief Justice of India and four senior Supreme Court judges. Seniority is determined by the number of years you've been a judge or the number of years you've served at the bar or your age or when you graduated law school. There are 
multiple criteria, but those criteria are under a separate law. So don't worry about it at the moment. The constitution does not have any uh, reference to what is seniority and the parliament by law can determine what is seniority. Okay. Now, even the Chief Justice of India is actually appointed through a collegium process. But we follow a principle of seniority that the outgoing Chief Justice will recommend the name of the next senior most Chief Justice as a matter of principle. Nowhere in the constitution does it say that the senior most judge of the Supreme Court must be made the Chief Justice of India. No. It is a matter of principle that we followed so that there is less executive interference in the appointment of the Chief Justice of India. Right? Understood? And if you think about it, the collegium comprises of, of judges on a seniority basis. So they will automatically recommend somebody on a seniority basis. And all other judges are appointed on the consensus of the collegium, wherein they all recommend one name. This name is then sent to the president. But technical details tell us that it is first sent to the law minister, then to the PM, and then to the president. The president can return the recommendation. And if they come back with the same recommendation, they have to appoint. That's the basic principle. None of this is mentioned in the constitution, which is why none of this is ever asked in the exam. Right? Similarly, we are high court judges. You have a smaller collegium, center stronger than the states, chief justice and two senior most high court judges. Okay? Two senior most, sorry, two senior most supreme court judges. The high court judges are not even a formal part of the collegium. Okay? Now, when the Chief Justice of the High Court is appointed, again, you follow a seniority principle and you consult the governor. This is dealt with in the memorandum of procedure. Similarly, when you are appointing other High Court judges, again, you need a consensus of the collegium and the President can also consult the Chief Justice of the relevant High Court. That's it. Now, who consults when? What is the process behind it? What if they say no? What if they say yes? I can make a two-hour video on this and entertain you with all the theatrics and the drama that there is. But my penchant for drama has, has to be kept at a back, back burner with respect to you clearing the exam. This is more than enough as far as your appointments are concerned. Simple, clear, effective and concise. Now, once you've understood appointments, let's understand qualifications, right? Now, as far as your basic qualifications are concerned, right? For the Supreme Court, you've got to be a citizen. It doesn't matter how you become a citizen. You've got to be a, or, and, and once you've become a citizen, you've got to be a high court judge for at least five years or multiple high courts in succession, or a high court lawyer for 10 years, or a distinguished jurist as per the opinion of the president, which is basically the opinion of the council of ministers, which is also how this is constitutional proof that the executive can play a role in the appointment of Supreme Court judges. In the history of this country, no distinguished jurist has been appointed as a Supreme Court judge. Now, the reason we have this is because the Supreme Court can examine the constitutionality of matters and sometimes while the judges will look at it from a purely judicial point of view, sometimes you may require a jurist to look at it from a scholarly point of view, from an academic point of view, if you're evolving the constitution, if you're evolving the manifestations of the constitution, right? Now, as far as High Court judges' qualifications are concerned, you've got to be a citizen, does not matter how. You would have held a judicial office, any judicial office, uh, lower court, etc., for 10 years, or you would have been a High Court lawyer for 10 years. Now, this is the interesting part. The same High Court lawyer for 10 years is equally eligible to become a Supreme Court judge and also a High Court judge. And the Supreme Court is a superior authority than the High Court. How do you have the same qualification for two bodies which are hierarchical in nature? It's because they mostly do the same thing. If I take center state disputes away, that's one special power of the Supreme Court to examine center state disputes.
and if the supreme court is examining a center state dispute the attorney general and the advocate general the attorney general will represent the center and the advocate general will represent the state concerned they are anyways because of office of profit not entitled to become supreme court judges apart from this the supreme court and the high courts can listen to exactly similar cases so if the kind of cases that you are going to hear are more or less the same then you require similar qualifications which is why you have a common qualification that you can be a high court lawyer for 10 years and equally competent to be a judge of the supreme court or the high court now the salary and the pensions of supreme court judges are charged to the consolidated fund of india charged means you cannot remove them or reduce them to a disadvantage and the salaries of high court judges are charged to the consolidated fund of the respective states whereas the pension of high court judges is charged to the consolidated fund of india why is that the case because according to the law a supreme court judge after retiring as a supreme court judge cannot practice in a formal court of law in a formal court of law anywhere in the country a supreme court judge cannot practice the age of retirement is 65 which means if you can't practice how are they going to sustain themselves which is why and it's a nationwide ban on practice so the cfi will look into it because it's a national fund high court judges cannot practice law in all the states that they have been high court judges high court judges can be transferred from one high court to the other so if you've been a high court judge in three states say up mp and karnataka after retiring at a, as a high court judge at the age of 62 you are still eligible to practice anywhere in the country except up mp and karnataka and your retirement age is 62 why because most of the times high court judges are promoted to supreme court judges so that you at least have some years of service and you will always notice this this 65 62 is a common number the age of retirement for state organizations will always be 62 and central organizations will always be 65 whether it's upsc or state public service commissions and so on and so forth right now the constitution does say the supreme court is in delhi but it does not say that the supreme court just has to be in delhi it can be in any other place as decided by the chief justice of india after the approval of the president rule number 4 checks and balances which is why you would have heard of a <coughs> this is why you would have heard of a lot of uh, recommendations and suggestions that we should have a constitutional court of india uh, at in delhi and you should have four regional supreme courts as the final courts of appeal for easing the appellate process right so this is your qualification and your basic service conditions now let us look at removal very simple very clear the grounds now let's understand this the removal of supreme court and high court judges is the exact same there is absolutely no difference and now you will slowly understand why because they fundamentally have very similar powers except for center state and certain extraordinary powers anyways so you've got similar powers so you will have similar procedures and also center stronger than the states rule number 2 the fundamentals of removal are in the constitution and these fundamentals of removal in the constitution are supported by a dedicated law called the judges inquiry act by a dedicated law called the judges inquiry act of 1968 theek hai interesting the constitution refers to the grounds and the broad majority that is required because at the end of the day it is going to be the parliament which is going to remove supreme court judges rule number 4 checks and balances the grounds that are mentioned are proved misbehavior and incapacity they have not been defined in any further detail at all all that it says is proved misbehavior or incapacity 
Now, what is proved, proved misbehavior and what is incapacity? No questions asked. Nobody has any idea. Are we clear on this? Because this has not been clearly defined anywhere. On the other hand, on the other hand, the Judges Inquiry Act gives you the details of the procedure. So I'll run you through a simple flowchart. Suppose you have to remove a Supreme Court or a High Court judge. You have to first start with a removal motion. One random person cannot stand up in a house and say, let us remove a Supreme Court judge. You will be wasting the already extremely valuable time of the house. So the removal motion, if it is introduced in the Lok Sabha, should be seconded by 100 members. If it is by the Rajya Sabha, it is, if it is in the Rajya Sabha, it has to be seconded by 50 members. Which means, the process of the removal of Supreme Court or High Court judges can begin either in the Raj Lok Sabha or in the Rajya Sabha. Once this motion has been seconded, this motion is presented to the presiding officer of that house. Even after having 100 supporters or 50 supporters respectively, the presiding officer can decide, can choose whether to admit or to reject. Now, you could argue some political interference here and understand that ultimately you will require a majority so some political will will anyways come, come to light. If the presiding officer rejects the, the motion, the matter ends right there. But if the presiding officer admits the motion, then you set up a three-member committee. Okay, This three-member committee will comprise of the Chief Justice of India. If the Chief Justice is removed, then any other senior Supreme Court judge, the Chief Justice of the High Court or the High Court of, uh, or another judge of the High Court and a distinguished jurist. This is to ensure that people with a judicial background are participating in the examination of the removal of a Supreme Court or a High Court judge. Because at the end of the day, you have to prove whether an act is in fact an act of proved misbehavior or incapacity. Right? If the committee finds you not guilty, matter ends there. If the committee finds you guilty, then the House votes. And then the House can either vote in favor or against. You require a special majority too, which is a two-layered majority. First, two-thirds of the members present and voting must say yes. And second, this has to be reconfirmed by more than half of the total strength of each of the houses. There shall not be a joint sitting. In the history of the country, we've had one such incidence where even after the committee had said, had found that judge guilty uh, and and, and we were able to reach the two-third majority part, but we were not able to confirm it with more than half of the total strength. So this is your simple removal process. The pre has asked you a question from here. That is why it becomes important. Okay. Now, let's move to the next part, which is jurisdiction. Simple, clear and effective. When we look at the Supreme Court jurisdiction, we understand there are essentially five types. Now you will find this to be different from your standard textbooks because the standard textbooks are not very clearly written on this. So you've got original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction means which is the first court that you can file this case at. That's what is meant by original jurisdiction. So you've got your writ jurisdiction under Article 32 where the Supreme Court can issue your five writs uh, for enforcement of fundamental rights only. Then center state disputes under Article 131 Clause 1 can only and only be filed in the Supreme Court. This is something which is often missed. Transfer petitions 139A1 and 139A2. There are two kinds of transfer petitions. One, if there is an issue which is the exact same issue or a very similar issue which is being dealt with at a high court and a smaller bench of the Supreme Court, then the Supreme Court can club the matter and put it under a larger bench. That is called a transfer petition of the first type. The second is if you want to transfer the matter from one high court to the other. This is often done, uh, especially in matrimonial cases where the people are living separately. For this transfer from of the first type, it has to have a similar question of law and transfer from one high court to another, this is done by Supreme Court, 
is this is you have to file a transfer petition to the Supreme Court. This is in the interest of justice. Now, what is the interest of justice? You it is open to interpretation. And <coughs> any election disputes with respect to the election of the vice president or the president under 71 can only and only be filed in the Supreme Court. Election petitions or election disputes of Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, State Legislative Assembly, State Legislative Councils, these can only be filed in the High Court. This is also a very interesting way of a hollow candy that the election commission of india the election commission of india is a nationally uh, the the election commission of india is a is a is a centrally appointed constitutional body and because it is a centrally appointed constitutional body the states have no role to play and the election commission is conducting all of these elections that is center stronger than the states and that is why as a candy given to the states that election petitions out of all of these elections will be always first heard at the high court and and the hollow candies the states have no actual role in high court appointments per se right then you have appellate jurisdiction which means you're going from a lower court to a higher court so article 132 tells you general civil criminal or other appellate uh, procedures you do not have to do them in detail under any circumstances this is forbidden 133 talks about civil appeals, 134 talks about criminal appeals and the basic principle is if you are going under an ordinary appellate route, the high court must deem it fit for it to be on appeal to the supreme court. It's not that the high court is, is, is strict about this but the high court must certainly deem it fit for appeal to the supreme court. Clear on this? Do we understand this? Is this alright? This is very very important. Okay. So the general understanding of, of normal appeals is, suppose you are at the high court and you have lost the case, you want to go on appeal to the supreme court, the high court will have to give you a certificate of appeal that yes there is some important question of law and yes the supreme court should look into it. Okay. Now extraordinary uh, appellate procedures, there is only one power called special leave petitions under 136. Now, this can happen from any lower court or any tribunal. You do not require a high court fitness certificate or a high court certificate of appeal. If there is a substantial question of law or a gross violation of, of justice, you can directly reach the Supreme Court and say this requires an interpretation of law. You are the final authority on the interpretation of law. We are here before you then also the Supreme Court will first hear, will first decide whether they want to take up the case or not. SLP is not a guarantee of a Supreme Court hearing. Then you have your advisory jurisdictions. There are two advisory jurisdictions, not one that is, as it is often commonly misunderstood. You have a presidential reference under 143.1 and 143.2. 143.1 is any matter of public importance and the Supreme Court can just be referred the matter to. Uh, by the president. Of course, the president will do so on the advice of the Council of Ministers. Now, here the Supreme Court has absolute powers to deny the advice. Why? Because of separation of powers. Because it could be the case that the executive may use the shoulders of the Supreme Court to make a decision without having the spine to do, them, do it themselves. 143 clause 2, if there is a legal opinion on a pre-constitutional obligation, for example, a pre-constitutional treaty or you require an interpretation of the Government of India Act 1935, there are several substantial questions of law, then the Supreme Court cannot deny, it has to give its recommendation, it has to give its advisory and the Supreme Court references are written as in reference. In your relationship between directive principles and fundamental rights, there is a very popular case called the in reference. Kerala higher education case which was essentially a presidential reference. In fact one of the judges cases was also a presidential reference. And then this has been in the news heavily plenary uh, sorry plenary jurisdiction. You've got 137 and 142. This is still not suomoto. Don't get it wrong. Plenary means the Supreme Court has given any judgment. There are two components to plenary jurisdiction, 
review and curative review is expressly mentioned under 137 the supreme court has given a judgment you believe that there is a bias to that judgment or some material facts were not considered then no matter what bench gave that judgment you can request for a review petition right can request for a review petition the word curative petition is nowhere mentioned in the constitution it is derived indirectly from article 142 which is in the news recently where uh, alleged assassination suspects of a former prime minister were recently released it says anyone who feels that any supreme court judgment is is causing a massive damage to justice is grossly unfair is abusing the law process you can request the supreme court to review the matter okay the ingredients of review petitions and curative petitions are in supreme court rules which is why you do not have to study them in detail at all as far as the pre is concerned the basic difference is review petitions are in the constitution directly curative is derived from 142 where the supreme court can pass any order in the interest of justice and two uh, you have to be related to the case as far as review petitions are concerned you don't have to necessarily be related to the case as far as curative petitions are concerned there are of course technical procedural guidelines that it would first be heard by a bench of three judges, uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice, another bench of three judges and the judges who were involved in the original decision. Then they can decide whether it can be sent back to the bench for reconsideration. There's a whole bunch of procedures in there, absolutely irrelevant as far as the pre is concerned. So this is your Supreme Court jurisdiction. Now that we know what our Supreme Court jurisdiction is, we shall now be looking into the hierarchy. When we say Supreme Court judgments are binding on lower courts, it is actually based on a legal principle called the principle of stare decisis, which basically means the judgments of a superior court and their value on lower courts. So a larger bench of the Supreme Court, let's understand what is a bench. A bench usually comprises of two, three judges where they hear cases in the open. Right? Anybody can attend a hearing of a Supreme Court case or even a High Court case. It is often also called division benches. Right? Now, <clears throat> so the decision of a larger Supreme Court bench is always binding on a smaller Supreme Court bench and it is also binding on another Supreme Court bench of the same strength. For example, let us say this is a five uh, judge bench. This was a two judge bench and this was a two judge bench. A judgment given by a five judge bench is binding on a two judge Supreme Court bench and a two judge Supreme Court bench of an equal strength. Although there is some jurisprudence where there are some conflicting views, but the larger understanding is this. Any decision of the Supreme Court is binding on all high courts in the country. The decision of High Court of State A is not binding on the High Court of State B. You can quote the decision of a High Court. So I, I can argue at the Allahabad High Court and say the Honorable Bombay High Court on a similar matter gave this decision, but the Allahabad High Court is not bound by the decision uh, or the judgment given by the Bombay High Court. Right? It has persuasive value. Similarly, judgments of international courts or judgments of foreign courts only have a persuasive value. And the judgments of high court of state A is only binding on the lower courts of the state A. It is not binding on lower courts of state B. So a uh, Jabalpur high court judgment is binding on the district courts of Madhya Pradesh, not the district courts of Assam. Right? So that's something you must understand. Now, once cases are filed, the registrar has taken an account of it. The registrar goes to the Chief Justice of India and the Chief Justice of India decides which case will be given to what judge and how many benches are we going to have for each case determining the nature of the case. 
that is why the CGI is called the master of the roster. This was in controversy a few years ago, where a few senior judges had held a press conference alleging some form of, of malfeasance in the matter. And the constitution very clearly says that under article 145 clause 3, article number is not important. If you are examining the constitutional validity of a law, if you are interpreting the constitution, if you are interpreting a substantial question of law, you will require a minimum bench of 13 judges, a uh, minimum bench of 5 judges, sorry, 5 judges and this is called a constitutional bench. The largest bench that has been set up so far in the history of the country is the 13th be uh, judge bench in the landmark Keswananda Bharti judgment. Keswananda Bharti versus State of Kerala in 1973 where we had a 13 judge constitutional bench. Your bare minimum requirement is 5. All right, okay. Now, let's do a quick comparison and understand why are we saying they're essentially the same things. See, the first we must the first element that we must understand is sue motor powers. Sue motor powers basically means you don't have to file a case in the court. The court can automatically file a case and call the aggrieved or call the parties concerned. Both Supreme Court and High Courts have suomoto powers, where do they get their powers from? Article 32 and 129 for the Supreme Court. One th uh, uh, Article 32 refers to your writs, which means if the Supreme Court believes there is a grave fundamental right violation and nobody has come to the court voicing the fundamental right violation, the Supreme Court can take up that case pro bono. And this does not happen as frequently as you think it does. In the history of this country, not even 100 Suomoto cases have been taken by the Supreme Court because this is a rare of the rare scenario. And this is like, for example, the last Suomoto case that the Supreme Court took up was the COVID-19 Suomoto case where the, where the Supreme Court had called the central government to question the management of oxygen and the delivery of oxygen, right? So, that's one way. Second is, if somebody has said something that violates the reputation of the Supreme Court, the Prashant Bhushan case, or somebody is not implementing a Supreme Court order, the Supreme Court can initiate contempt proceedings on their own. You don't need somebody else to come to the Supreme Court and tell them, see, see, that person is making fun of you, or see, see, that person is, is, is not following your judgment. Okay? Similarly, your high courts, under 215 also have contempt powers for high courts and all lower courts. Under 226, similar writs. But here high courts can issue writs not only for fundamental rights, but also for legal rights, which is why high courts have a wider writ jurisdiction than the Supreme Court. And because the high courts are also uh, in charge of all local subordinate courts, they can sometimes take suomoto action if there is a subordination discrepancy. Now, there are four extremely important points of conflict, uh, very important. One, so high courts have higher writ jurisdiction than, than the Supreme Court as far as uh, writs are concerned. So the high courts therefore can uh, look at writs for both fundamental and legal rights. Now, this also means something, that there could be a law which is violating a fundamental right and you could challenge that law both in the Supreme Court and the High Court. If the Supreme Court declares the law is invalid, it is invalid throughout the country. If the High Court declares that law is invalid, it is only invalid for that state. Which is why when the Delhi High Court had originally, before the Navtej Singh Johar case, declared homosexuality to be decriminalized, it was only decriminalized for the state of Delhi. Then the central government appealed against the Nas Foundation case, uh, Nas Foundation case to the Supreme Court. Uh, then the Supreme Court sent it back to the Delhi High Court. The Delhi High Court reviewed its own judgment. A few years later, Navtej Singh Johar's case was filed. And that's when the Supreme Court said homosexuality has been decriminalized for the entire country. Which basically means the constitutionality of a law can be challenged both at the Supreme Court and the High Courts. That's an incredibly important interpretation. This is what we are referring to. And while the Supreme Court can only punish for its own contempt, High Courts can punish for contempts of the High Court and or lower courts. 
and death penalties are confirmed by the high courts because uh, this is a law and order matter which is a state subject right so this is all you need to know as far as your judicial system is concerned your basic reading list is uh, your chapters for uh, Lakshmikan 6 and 6c are more or less the same so you've got the supreme court judicial review judicial activism PIL, High Courts and Subordinate Courts. The important part is, please do not do the technical details of Supreme Court jurisdictions or High Court jurisdictions. As far as tribunals are concerned, just know under 323A and 323B, what are the kind of tribunals that can be made. The questions that are asked are fairly logical in nature and they can be solved anyway. So we'll hopefully, we've got two more lectures left. The next lecture will be center and state and, and local self-government and the last lecture will be on bodies. We'll finish it in a day or so and from next week we'll start PYQs through simple elimination techniques. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Judiciary is uh, of personal interest to me because of academic backgrounds and professional congruency. So you will see me more excited about judiciary than other parts of polity per se. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your support. Uh, the kind of views and the kind of comments that all of you have been sharing. I read every comment. I try to reply as much as I can. It is very, very heartwarming. And I shall always, forever, be in your debt. Thank you. Keep watching. Bye-bye.